I planned this painting over a month ago. It wasn't one that I wanted to rush into. It's a beautiful lady that came to visit and she posed in my garden when the roses were in full bloom around May, around the time of our wedding anniversary. And she's sitting in the flower garden with the archways that my husband and I bought for each other for our 50th wedding anniversary. So it's very special. We love the lady. We love the garden. So I'm working with the Winder and Newton watercolour pans. And this is my Da Vinci Pure Sable brush. And when I do a larger wash, I will use my Pettigris Pearl mop brush. With watercolour, you don't need many brushes. I find a big mop brush and a beautiful detail brush and perhaps a rigger for some work is all you need. Anything else is just a bonus. Now, you probably need sketching skill more with watercolour than you do for oil paint. You can sketch before you paint, which is the normal for my watercolour style, or you can paint first and sketch the details in with the paint which is my normal for oil painting and pastel work. So with the transparent medium, I tend to start with my sketch down very lightly on the paper before I begin. Because the work is transparent, it doesn't allow room for error. Whereas when you're working with an opaque medium that you can push around and construct with, I tend to do my painting with the paint later in the detail in the refinement stage and um, I'll tend to go for massing in of light and shade and tones and colours initially and worry about the integrity of the detail work last. So you still need those drawing skills but you use them at different stages of the painting depending on the medium that you're working with. As I've explained before in my other tutorial videos, the skills that you learn when you're painting with one medium will apply to the other. The only thing that will differ is maybe is the technique that you use for that particular work. And uh, as I said, with watercolour, you're working with a transparent medium and you need to let the water do a lot of the work. So you need... You don't want to be in full control. You want to allow a little bit of excitement, a little bit of um, keeping it unknown, how it's going to finish. You can start off with an idea in mind, but let the water be the boss. Don't try to dictate to it too much or you just have a very tight amateurish work. And So you need a lot more confidence to do watercolour than perhaps doing the opaque mediums. With your opaque mediums, your oils and your pastels, your acrylics, you pretty well know how you can plan how that work is going to end up and you can pretty well make it end up the way you plan. And, um, with the watercolour, allow for the water to do a lot of it and just egg it along towards the general idea that you want but allow for that beautiful transparency and the interaction of the pigments on the wet paper let it surprise you now I'm working on a 300 gram sheet of Fabriano Artistico paper <laughs> and every time I say something like that, <laughs> I'm um, thinking that one of these days I'm going to be struggling to come up with those names. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I'm working full time now in my 70s. <laughs> I want to get out as much tuition as I can while I'm still confident to pull up all those names at short notice from memory. <laughs> now, I love um, my painting. I had to think about this one because uh, I need, with watercolour, to be a little bit more careful. Um, being transparent, as I said, no room for error here. Um, I really um, planned this work very carefully. And uh, as I said, there's uh, no correcting it as watercolour. 
But keep in mind, you don't have any wasted paper, so you might as well use quality because if it doesn't work as watercolour, well, you know you can go and do that pastel work on top. I don't intend to. I intend to make this work as watercolour. In fact, I've got a spot on the wall just above my desk. This will look lovely if it turns out as I'm hoping. Now, there's a lot of white roses in the garden where this lady is sitting. And all I have done is put down a little bit of light colour of sunshine. I've put down a little bit of the cadmium lemon yellow. And I've put it where the lady's hair will be, her face, her arms and legs, where the sunlight will be on them. And I've put it a little bit where the white roses will go and on the chair legs. I haven't decided yet what the chair legs will be. She's in a green plastic chair and um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm going to paint them green or mock up a cane chair out of my imagination or reference photos at this stage or just leave the chair legs and subdued in shadow. So there's one tiny little bit of this painting that is not planned. I'm going to leave that to suggest itself later on. It's not going to be a focal point of the painting the chair legs, so it's most likely I'll just leave them vague and out of focus and in shadow. But the roses in this rose garden are very much a major part of the painting. And so having glazed on a little bit of the lemon yellow, I'm now cutting in around all these roses. I'm not trying to draw or paint an individual rose. I'm just cutting in patches of sky, patches of foliage. There'll be some further back, so you've got the very pale cerulean and cobalt blues in the sky. Very, very atmospheric and hazy in the distance. And then you're coming in with the viridian green, which is a beautiful transparent green. It's my favourite green for a watercolour. You can start with that beautiful jade green and then modify it. You can add a little bit of red to it to tone it back, a little bit of blue to it, a bit of yellow to it. So there's many ways you can vary that one green. But you don't need a lot of greens on your palette if you're a watercolourist. Uh, perhaps one is more than enough for Australians where we don't have a lot of green in our foliage. And uh, perhaps if you're in Europe, um, Ireland, you might want two or three greens. But uh, to give you the variety, the light over there is a different light and the greens are quite vivid. But uh, for Australians, this beautiful jade green, that will get you through doing seascapes and it will also work in portraiture and flower painting and just adding either, as I said, yellows, reds or blues to it to vary it to get the different tones. In this case I'm going in with an even more viridian, just intensifying that very subtle jade wash background that suggested foliage behind the lady. I don't actually want a lot of bright green at all in this painting but you can see how it fades away as your painting dries. That wash that you put down will always fade. Now I'll come back while my painting paper is still very slightly damp, not wet anymore, but very slightly damp. So that when I put down these little dancing around the brush, it's more than a doll, but you kind of dance this brush around to get very natural looking foliage clusters in there. And the edges of what I'm putting down is softening. The um, very slightly damp paper is working those edges and taking away any hard lines from them. I drew out these roses and so I'm not actually painting the roses, I'm painting the negative space around the roses and I'm cutting in, this could be a big rose clump and lots of little ones in behind it and just by this cutting in I'm starting to shape up this grouping of roses. I'm adding a little bit of cobalt blue into this because I feel that it's getting a little bit too green. A little accents of the cobalt blue here. And again, I'm allowing the slightly damp paper to interact with what I'm putting down and starting to move it around a little bit. 
because we don't want to have any hard edged patches of blue here. So very much relying on the fact that my paper with the dampness in it will change what I'm putting down. And you have to hope <laughs> that it's going to change it for the better and for the way that you want it to. But you don't know. And that's the excitement with watercolor. You need to free yourself from control. You have to have fun with watercolor.